Hi, uh, this is the Ancient and Medieval Lecture for Tuesday, December 1st, 2020. Uh, I will start with an announcement. I have decided to make your case study optional. That means is, if you wish to turn in your 50 fact sheet, uh, by tomorrow, you may do so. If you wish to do the profile, you may do so. If you've already done work, you might as well turn in what you've got, uh, if it's complete, to get some credit. But uh, it is not required. The um, people who did poorly during the first quarter, you really should do it. In fact, you should not only do your 50 fact sheet and profile, you should also do uh, an essay and you should do a video presentation of a few minutes following the video uh, guidelines, because otherwise you're probably not going to pass for the quarter, uh, for the semester, which is how we get credit here at Charter. So that is my advice, but it is now optional. That's number one. Number two, some weird, bizarre rumor, which I don't understand, started to circulate apparently among the online-only community, that's you, uh, saying that online students would be doing the topic of the Olympic Games. No, I don't know where people got that. Online students were supposed to contact me with three suggested topics, of which I would pick one that they would then do. So, no. The, the Olympic Games is not a generic topic for anyone who's online. And if you choose to move forward with this, um, I do not want to hear, see a bunch of online pro projects on that. If you have a topic and you wish to proceed, you may do so. If you do not have a topic, then you should contact me immediately if you choose to do so. Your uh, Odyssey worksheet was due today. Uh, so hopefully that will be in or by 6 a.m. tomorrow. Any questions about these announcements? Okay. Don't thank me all at once. God forbid you, you look pleased that I've just taken some work off your plate. Um, or maybe it's the masks. Maybe it's those Sorry, terrible masks. Well, I mean, okay. I, I, I did spend my entire weekend doing the entire case study. Well, so. good. Then you will turn it in and you will get a good grade for it. That's what will happen. If you did the work, you deserve the credit. Okay? <laughs> I get it, actually. Yeah. I've, I've done this. Um, lovely year. So, uh, there are no questions. We'll move on. And for those of you who are behind the uh, camera, if, again, you wish to move, we've got open seats there and there if you want them. What we have discussed so far is the nature of Greek civilization and its unique emphasis on human creativity. The idea that each city-state would have several ways of encouraging every citizen to take part in public life by speaking in the Agora or becoming a student in the Agora and asking questions of the speakers or by going to the amphitheater and seeing the dramas, the tragedies, the comedies that the various playwrights uh, would turn into plays, or active religious life. When the temple would sacrifice uh, animals, the priests would get the meat, at least certain pieces of meat, um, left over after the other parts were sacrificed to the gods. But quite often what would happen in Greek religion is that a family who was, say, celebrating a wedding or uh, just, you know, uh, having a reunion or something, uh, they might buy uh, a, a larger animal, uh, not just a sheep or a goat, uh, but, but maybe even a, a cow or a bull. And when that was sacrificed, the meat would then be shared in a feast dedicated to the gods of the temple or the god of the family. Uh, and not only the family would take part, but maybe the neighborhood would as well. The temple was a place where people would gather and feast, as well as be reminded of what the core beliefs of the society were and have those big questions of life and death answered. <laughs> 
Yes. It was a common place at higher class weddings to gather various symbols of hair of the goddess of marriage. That makes total sense. Um, and hopefully uh, Hera would bless their marriage with less infidelity than she had to put up with from Zeus, who was a horn dog. Sorry, that's like... 113 a... illegitimate children. <laughs> I never knew that. I knew it was a lot. Who counted it? I don't know. I read about it in, my, in Bullfinch. Okay, well, that makes sense. I trust Bullfinch. Good source. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, these are the kinds of city-states that are being built in the Hellenic period from the 800s to the 600s BC. And I told you about how when a city-state got too large, they would send out colonies as seeds of civilization to spread Greek, Greek culture, but also to preserve, to some extent, a uh, small-town feel, which allowed each citizen to feel like they were an important person who had uh, a place in taking part in public life. Um, so this is the Greek society that we are going to begin studying in, in more depth now. While Greece has risen to about 500 BC, the various seven oriental empires have been going through their various motions. But by 500 BC, the Medes and the Persians had taken over the entire rest of the Eastern Mediterranean, the Middle East region, uh, as far away as India. So, from the Indus River in the east, almost, to northern Greece, what is called Thrace in the west, which is in Europe, from the shores of the Black Sea and the Caucasus Mountains in the north, to Egypt, and its cataracts on the Nile River in the south, to the border of the Arabian Desert, the great kings of Persia spread their reign. And the great kings of Persia were wise in the art of empire. First off, Persians themselves ethnically are Aryans or are. Uh, or Iranians. The Aryans, Iranians come from the same root word. Uh, the Indo-European language group uh, is shared by Iranians, by North Indians, by uh, Western and uh, Northern and Southern Europeans. Uh, when Hitler talks about Aryans, he's talking about the Germanic branch of the Aryan ethnic group, but Aryans also include the Iranians. And if you, uh, if you encounter Iranians, or if you look at photographs of important Iranians in history, um, their skin may be darker, their hair may be darker, but the ethnic group uh, is clearly related to Caucasians from Europe. In fact, the term Caucasian refers to the mountains in northwestern Iran. The Iranians, in their earliest history, were horsemen. They love the horse. They are a people of the horse. They're not Central Asian nomads like the, um, like the Mongols or, or the Huns, but they are very much uh, a part we're here, um, of that Asian tradition of a mobile people. And so when the Iranians spread out, uh, a lot of the troops that they used are horse soldiers. One of the things you need to understand about cavalry or horse soldiers in ancient times is they didn't have stirrups. This is very important. Uh, so what horse riders would do is they would grasp the horse with their thighs and with their calves and ankles. A horse soldier could be a good scout without stirrups. They might even make a decent horse archer. But... In terms of shock or heavy cavalry, ancient cavalry stank on ice for this region, reason. Okay, here I am on my horse. Charge! And I, I go at my enemy, boom, and I, I lean into them with the spear or the lance. Well, Newton said, for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. What's going to happen as I, I'm riding towards this target uh, with all the momentum that my horse has, and my spear touches the target. What's going to happen to me? 
Yeah. I'm going to be thrown right off my horse. My horse is going to run right out from under me, and I'm going to be on the ground, hopefully without a broken tailbone. Because no stirrups. Only when stirrups come into this part of the world at the end of Roman times uh, do heavy cavalry really become possible. Because at that point, you can stand up in your stirrups, lean forward, and you're locked into the horse. It's like wearing a seatbelt in a car that has an accident. You're probably much safer wearing a seatbelt than not. Whether there should be laws about it, that's another question. But you're certainly probably safer wearing a seatbelt. And on a horse, you're much safer um, being in stirrups if you're going into combat than you're not. The Persians, does anyone recall what religion they follow? Because we talked about it. I'll give you a hint. What am I pointing at? What am I pointing at? The light. So if, if light is a hint, what religion did we deal with that dealt with a lord of light? Yes? Zoroastrianism, that's right. Persian Zoroastrianism, yes? Dualistic. Yeah. The Persian dualistic system whereby you have two equal and opposite gods. Ahura Mazda, the wise lord, the lord of light. Araman, the dark lord, the lord of darkness. Unlike God and Satan in monotheistic ideas, these two powers are equal. And the fate of the universe rests in our hands because every choice we make, even a choice like do you want fries on that or do you want to walk or ride you know, to your destination, has a moral component to it. And ultimately, the choices of every living person will either tilt the universe into perpetual heaven and heavenly light or eternal chaotic anarchic darkness. So the Persians are not pagans in the sense of the Greeks uh, who are polytheists uh, who believe in many gods, a whole family of gods. And the Olympians are certainly not the only divine beings in their, in their universe. Um, the Persians are much closer to more modern senses of faith in that there are only two forces. And you're dealing here basically with the, with the religious equivalent of matter and antimatter that are coming together and forming the universe. So this is something about the Persian people themselves. As they spread out, they conquer from Persia. Okay, Persian heartland is the Iranian uh, plateau here behind the Zagros Mountains. And um, they spread westward into the land of the Medes, eastward, right up along the uh, border of the Hindu, uh, the Indus Valley region. Northward into what we would consider to be parts of Kazakhstan and Afghanistan. Uh, northwestward to uh, the Caucasus Mountains and westward into the lands of Lydia and the Ionian Greeks, the colonies uh, that were set up by the Greeks. They also pass into Mesopotamia, conquering Babylon. They take over Syria. They take over Judea. They take over Egypt. And uh, again, as far south as at least the first and second cataracts. And they go as far west as Chironatia, which is this area of Greek cities here in North Africa. Persia is the world's first world empire. And what I mean by world empire is they rule everyone. They rule, considering how small the known world was, they rule most of the known world, which is saying something. They've got literally dozens and dozens of cultures under their one government rule. That's an empire. An empire is when one government rules over many cultures or civilizations. So Persia now rules Egypt. Persia now rules Babylon. Persia now rules the Jews. The Jews are happy about this. Remember, when Cyrus of Persia conquers Babylon, uh, the Jews of Jerusalem are there as slaves during the Babylonian captivity. And Cyrus frees them. Even though he's a Zoroastrian, uh, the Jews see him as an agent of God, as a hand of Yahweh. 
as a holy person because he frees them from the Babylonian captivity and tells them to go home, rebuild their temple, worship as you like, just pay your taxes, send us earth and water, and send men when we need them in war. Oh, and follow the basic laws of the king, which are not that hard to follow. So there is great love, actually, between the Hebrews and the Jews. Now, if you think about distance in terms of communication, the time it takes for a message to get from one end of your land to the other end of your land. The Persian Empire is probably the largest human empire in history. I'll say that again. In terms of the speed of communications, the Persian Empire is probably the largest empire in human history. Now, it's not the largest in terms of land area or population, but the fastest way to send a message in those days is by a horse courier. So, you have an event that occurs near the Indus Valley, actually from your perspective, sorry, an event that happens near the Indus Valley. And you want to pass that message on to the capital and even as far away as the Greek border in Thrace. So, how do you get that message from here to there? Well, the Persians set up a series of what are called post roads. Post roads. Now, what post roads are, are not actually Roman-style highways with pavement. They are routes. And along these routes, every few miles, you've got a, 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 a building with a corral, with food, with riders, and I... I'm at the border, I have my message, I ride all through my horse, my horse gets tired out, I stop at the first uh, way station, I exchange horses, I ride for the next third of the day, my horse is worn out, I stop at the next way station, I exchange horses, I then ride as far as dusk, I stop there, I'm exhausted, my horse is exhausted. The message, though, does not stop. Another courier is where there waiting and he takes my message and everyone else's and then rides a third of the way through the night, stopping at a place, exchanging horses, another third of the way through the night, stopping. And eventually, the message is going to reach Parasopolis, which is the capital of Persia. It's uh, over in this region. Now, after that, messages are going to be sent out from there. So again, the, the messages don't stop. The horses are exchanged. The men are exchanged. The message keeps going. So by post road, from the Hindu, uh, from the Indus Valley River region, all the way to Thrace in northern Europe, uh, in north of Greece, it might take uh, the message two months, six weeks, two months, to get from one end of the empire to the other. This is an accomplishment. This is a huge area. And remember how difficult traveling by land can be. You've got brigands, you don't have, you don't have good roads. But the post-road system, by having frequent way stations where you can change your horse or where the rider can be exchanged, or you can get help if you need it, and the frequent system of messages that radiate out from the capital and, and, and bounce back from the uh, frontiers, makes it possible for the great kings of Persia to rule. So the post-road system is important, but the Persian Empire, even with the post-road system, is immense beyond belief. Today, there are over a dozen nations that make up what used to be the Persian Empire under the Achaemenids. You're going to hear, hear me refer to this empire not only as the Persian Empire, but as the Achaemenid Empire. You'll see the spelling in your notes. Achaemenid refers to the ruling family. Um, there's a later Persian Empire in late Roman times called the Sassanids, and the Sassanid Empire is a different Persian Empire under a different royal family. The problem, though, that the great king of Persia, the king of kings of Persia, has is not just getting messages out to his people. What the Persian king does to rule his various areas is he appoints governors that are called satraps. 
So you would be a satrap of this region. You would be a satrap of this region. Your border would be somewhere around here. You would be a satrap of this area, so, 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 so. And you'd have an extra big area of wilderness over there that you're responsible for, too. So the Persians do appoint regional governors, or satraps. However, for the most part, unless the satraps are ruling over a restive, rebellious people, they will let the local leaders handle day-to-day -day administration. If they want, they'll interfere with the local rulers if the local rulers start being disloyal. They can stop policies that they think are unwise. If the local ruler turns out to be a nut job, they'll replace him. But in general terms, the satraps control uh, the local rulers with a very loose hand. But if they need to take action, they can. They've got troops at their disposal, they've got money at their disposal, and they have the power of the great king because they are his agents. Knowing human nature as you do, what's the problem with that? If I'm the great king in Parsigarda or Parasopolis, and I have you all as my satraps, what, what do I have to worry about? Uh, some kind of take power in that area? Yeah. You might decide that I'm a buffoon and an idiot. And why should a buffoon and an idiot be your boss? <laughs> You'll ask this question many times in your life as you look at your boss. Uh, but why would you have loyalty to an incompetent, to a buffoon, to an idiot? Why should you serve when you could rule? After all, you on the frontier have not only your own army, you've got access to tribes that you have to keep the peace with. What if you offered them a cut of all the treasure in the treasury in the capital? So the risk I run in giving satraps so much power, and since they're so far away from me in terms of communication, is if they grow, grow disloyal, I may not know about it until it's too late. So how do I deal with this? Well, the eyes and the ears of the king. <clears throat> the Persians set up a really good secret service. The secret service is known as the eyes and ears of the king. These people being spies don't walk around wearing uniforms. They don't have little badges that have an eye and an ear on it with a crown you know, to represent that they're the eyes and ears of the king. You, as a satrap, would know that there are at least a few agents, plural, in various parts of your command. And the eyes and the ears of the king are probably not going to take action unless they really, really feel that there's a sudden danger to the empire. What they will do is report on everything you do to the great king. So if, for example, Ms. Beagleman was disloyal and was raising an army to march on the capital and trying to make alliances with her neighboring satraps, I may not know about it except that I've got at least half a dozen eyes and ears in your area. And they're going to tell me everything that you're doing. And even if you found one or two eyes of the ears of the king, you don't know all of them. There always could be others. So the very existence of the eyes and the ears of the king tend to retard people's ambitions, tend to slow them down and act as a break on rash, imprudent action. Because I tell you, if the king finds out that you're plotting against him, satrap or no, you will die long and you will die slow and you will pray for death and eventually you'll get your wish. They have all sorts of torture in the Persian Empire reserved for traitors. So the eyes and ears of the king by their existence discourage treason. But also by their active reporting and loyalty to the king, uh, they counter treason. They encourage people to be their best. What if you, who did the work over the weekend, actually decided to hell with it? I'm going to be I'm going to be lazy for a while because I worked so hard. I I darn it, I deserve it. 
Well, the problem with a satrap being lazy for a while is that you're not collecting all the taxes that you should for me. You're not playing whack-a-mole with the various troublemakers in your area, keeping them down. You're not doing your job to the optimum level of your ability. If I find out that you're slacking off, I, I may, if I like you and think that you have potential, send you a reprimand. Hey, fix this. Or I may just replace you. So your job performance is not only a formal process where people come by and review your work, it's also something that every time an eye or ear of the king reports, they're going to give an opinion on. They're going to give their impressions on. So this tends to keep everyone honest. It's a very good system, and it works. Aha. And uh, to give you an example, one of the various civilizations that is under Persian rule are the Phoenicians. You may remember the Phoenicians as the great mariners of the ancient world. They're the people who found the city of Carthage. Not found as in, oh, there's Carthage. They founded it. They, they, they established the city of Carthage right here, which is the greatest colony of the Phoenicians. They allowed families to go here. It basically became a third center of Phoenician culture, along with Sidon and Tyre in what is now Lebanon. They also <clears throat> established colonies like the Greeks, all around the greater Mediterranean and Black Sea basins. And there are rumors <clears throat> that the Phoenicians, being such good mariners, were able to actually go out into the Atlantic and not only go to the tin islands of Britain and ship tin across the Atlantic to the Mediterranean in ships made of light wood and sometimes reeds and grass. Think about the guts that takes. Yeah, I've got a ship made of reed, reeds and grass and a little bit of wood, and I'm going to load up with tin, which is a rock or a metal, depending upon how far it's been refined. That's an amazingly gutsy thing to do. But there are rumors that uh, Phoenician mariners went south from the mouth of the uh, Mediterranean Sea and even circumnavigated Africa. I don't buy them. They are not persuasive to me. I know how hard it was for the Portuguese to do that 2,000 years later. But there are rumors. And if any ancient people could do it, the Phoenicians could because they were such good sailors. Okay. Did the Phoenicians have to learn the Persian language? No. Did the Phoenicians have to worship Ahura Mazda? No. Did the Phoenicians have to stop dressing like Phoenicians, using the mannerisms of Phoenicia, any of that? No. They had to pay their taxes, and they had to go to uh, <clears throat> war when Persia went to war and send ships and men to do that. And they had to basically obey the few laws that the king had for everyone. Like, don't be disloyal. As long as they did that, the Persians basically... Leave them alone. It's the difference between <clears throat> walking a dog. Say you've got a big dog, big family dog, German Shepherd, Rottweiler, Great Dane, big dog. You can walk that dog with a really tight leash. And every move is controlled by you. I've seen people do that. For the most part, I think it's obnoxious. When I walk a dog, as long as the dog and I are clear on who's the boss, and it's me, um, I like letting the dog have as much freedom as I can allow. I, I'm not going to let the dog sail me. A, I'm big. B, uh, it's not a good uh, habit for the dog to be in, to just run and, and drag the owner along behind. Oh, please don't. Um, but I like giving the dog some freedom if it's a reasonable situation to do that. The dog probably enjoys the walk more for having the ability to stop at a bush, to walk around it, to get a sense of whether or not they want to pee there or not. The dog is happier, and I am happier, having a loose leash policy rather than a tight leash policy. It makes the Persians a very effective empire. As you will see later when we talk about Athens, they are not going to follow this model, and it will it will hurt them in the long run. So, Greek 
huge areas of what is now Turkey, what we now call Ionia, or what, we, uh, what was then called Ionia, now come under the rule of the Persian Empire. And this is the first time a major Greek region has come under Persian rule. And there are problems. Whereas the Jews are happy being left alone as long as they are allowed to worship God in their own way, the Greeks have all of this stuff about free speech in the Agora, about uh, creativity, about coming up with new ideas and new ways of doing things, and criticizing the way things are being done now. All of this that make Greek civilization so vibrant is seen by the Persians as needless troublemaking. Oh, those Greeks. They are always whinging. They are always complaining. They're always chattering. Bah, 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 bah. They're always evaluating. They're critics. They complain all the time. They will not shut up and do their jobs and live their lives quietly. No, they're, they've got to be excellent. They've got to be thinking and doing at the peak. They've got to aspire to... It's, it's just annoying for the Persians. And so the Persians try to damp down on this. Just calm down. You don't have to constantly evaluate everything in life. Well, actually, Greeks do. Socrates once says, um, that's one of the quote, big best quotes on my walls, uh, an unexamined life is not worth living. What that means is, from his point of view, and, and in general, from the Greek point of view, you are supposed to think about everything. You're supposed to be a bit Odysseus-like in not just taking things for granted. You're supposed to criticize, evaluate, assess, judge. And if you stop doing those things, you're not really living, are you? The Greeks say to each other. So the Persians try a little more to suppress this ongoing chatterboxness that the Greeks have. Finally, Ionia rebels. We cannot live under these conditions. They are intolerable to us. We cannot live under an empire that suppresses our very basic rights to speak and act and be thoughtful beings. Ionia revolts. And most of Ionia are colonies of Athens. So, the Ionians send a delegation to the city of Athens, to the General Assembly, which is uh, where any citizen can go and take part in their Congress. And the delegation lists all of the various things that the Greek Ionians deem tyrannical about the Persian rule. And they say to Athens, as our mother city, as we colonies were your children, we need your help now to fight the Persians and drive them out of our lands. We cannot live as Greeks under Persian rule. We need your help, please. And here is democracy at the crossroads. Remember, oh, and you will learn more, but remember from your readings, Athens doesn't elect a bunch of politicians to run affairs. The Athenians directly participate in voting on things like war and peace, taxes and so forth. So the appeal that the Ionians make is not to a president or to a congress or to a governor. It's to the people of Athens, relatives of the Ionians, cousins of them, culturally and physically. What to do? There is a peace party. And the peace party, or the doves, they say, it's sad what's happening to the Ionians. But you must understand, the problems of others are not our concern. These are our colonies, they're not us. The Persians have done nothing to us. If we get involved, the Persians will inevitably win, because they're a world empire. And they will come around or across the Aegean Sea to get payback against us. 
if we stay out of it, the Persians might leave us alone. If we get involved, the Persians will certainly be our enemies. And they rule such a vast empire. Could you imagine one little city-state fighting the entire Persian Empire? We've got to stay out of it. That's the Dove's position. The War Party, or the Hawk position, says this. That's so short-sighted. The Persian Empire, every generation it has existed, has expanded its borders. Last generation, they weren't in Europe. Then they took Thrace, north of Greece. You don't think they're coming here? They're going to come here. It's their nature. And if they come here, we'll be on our own, fighting for our lives without allies. But if we take this opportunity, we can go across the Aegean after them. We can burn their cities. We can fight with the allies, the Ionians. We can fight and beat them off and keep them away from our homes. Better that if, if fighting is inevitable, and, and we contend it is inevitable that the Persians will expand and come after us sooner or later, let's, let's fight now while we have allies, and when we can fight across the sea on their territory, damage their cities, burn their, kill their people. Back and forth, the struggle rages. And they come up with a compromise. And if you've ever wondered, the word compromise means that everyone involved goes away a little disappointed. Here's the compromise. Athenians may volunteer to cross the sea and fight. The city of Athens will not directly intervene officially. Unofficially, you want to volunteer, build some warships, head across, be our, be our guests. Yeah, that's going to work well. So, uh, an army of Athenian volunteers, backed up by warships, is formed. They cross the Aegean Sea, and they not only help the Ionians, they drive on the city of Sardis, which is the satrap's capital, and they burn it. The city of Sardis is burned to the ground. This is the high point of the Ionian Rebellion. But great king Darius is not having it. He organizes a great army, moves into Ionia, crushes the revolt, avenges the burning of Sardis and learns of the Athenian involvement. And he makes the determination, Athens will pay. And anyone who stands with Athens will pay. In the year 490 BC, Darius, great king of the Persians, king of kings, launches the first invasion of Greece. It is a seaborne attack an amphibious landing. Darius forces cross the Aegean Sea and they make a landing here at Marathon on the other side of the Attic Peninsula. They land here at Marathon. Here is Marathon Beach. Now, the Athenians did have a defense treaty with Sparta, the other great Greek city-state. When the Persians were spotted, however they were going to invade, the Spartan army was to come to Athens' aid, and the Spartans are the best army in Greece. However, the Spartans have to be told in this time. It takes time to get a message from Athens up here to Sparta down here and back again. Even if you send the messenger by ship, it's still going to take time. So the Athenian army marches out of the city to screen and observe the Persians. The people of Athens of the Peace Party say, you brought this on us, you damn hawks, you damn warmongers, you made this happen. Now you want to take the army out 
and meet the Persians in the open, or at least observe them, you could get destroyed. So this is what we insist on. If the Persians show up here, when you're gone, we're surrendering. We are not going to fight them. You want to go out with the army and screen them? Fine. If you're not back here, when Persians arrive, we are opening the gates, running up the proverbial white flag, and we are going to hope that they will show mercy to us. That's it. And the, the peace party gets that. So the army leaves Athens under its generals, a committee of strategoi, or generals. The Athenians do everything by group decision. They are a democracy. The only elected officials in the entire Athenian democracy are the ten generals, or strategoi. Each general is elected. And uh, the leading personality among these generals is a man named Miltiades. So, the Greeks, the Athenians, should I say, arrive, and they establish a camp at the top of the hill to observe the Persians. The Persians are offloading from their ships 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, 50,000 men, horses and equipment coming ashore at Marathon. Remember, if you can't see, feel free to move, okay? Miltiadi says, we've got to attack. The other generals say, are you bleeping nuts? That's the Persian army. They outnumber us five to one or more. The Spartans aren't here yet. And then a messenger comes. The Spartans are not coming because there is a religious festival and only a fool would thwart the gods before going into battle. Sparta will be there in two to four weeks. Wait for us behind your walls, you sissy Athenians. So Sparta says to Athens, Hide behind your walls, wait, we'll get there, and then we'll fight the Persians. Common sense would say the Athenians are good sailors, they're good merchants, they're good philosophers. They're not good foot soldiers. And the Persians' army, army down there is a massive army that outnumbers them in every kind of troop, except heavy infantry. But Miltiades says, no, 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 you don't understand. Right now, there are 50,000 men down on that beach who speak dozens of languages. They are in confusion. Even today, the most difficult military operation to pull off is an amphibious landing on a hostile shore. <clears throat> The U.S. Marines made it look easy in World War II, landing on island after island that the Japanese held. But the truth is, it's never been easy. The Persians are in complete chaos. An army unit shows up expecting their horses and equipment to be in the next two ships. They land, and there's no, they have no idea where those particular ships are. They try asking, but this unit are Babylonian uh, spearmen. And everyone around them, you've got Egyptians, you've got Jews, you've got Phoenicians, you've got Persians. Does anyone speak Babylonian? Does anyone speak Babylonian? It is utter chaos, Miltiades says. We need to attack now, while there's chaos, without the Spartans. Strike one! Military science and wisdom, please make sure you have your notes out, says that you don't attack unless you have every advantage. Miltiades' notion that the Persians are in chaos, therefore it's time for attack, goes against military logic. However, he persuades the other strategia. Second. So they say, okay, we'll fortify this hill, and the Persians can come up at us, up at us, and we'll have the advantage because we'll have the high ground, which actually does matter in ancient battles, if not in lightsaber combat. 
lightsaber combat, having the high ground is kind of stupid. What it means is that you can get your ankles chopped out from under you. But in real ancient battles, the enemy gets tuckered out climbing up the hill, and uh, you can throw rocks down on him. You have an advantage on the high ground. So military wisdom says, hold this position, hold the high ground. Miltiades says, no, don't get it, do you? Hello? We've got to go down there right now and hit them while they're confused. If we give them time, every hour we give them, they get more organized. If we wait for them, we're waiting for them to organize. And if they're allowed to organize, they'll come after us and they'll crush us like a bug. We have to go give up the high ground and attack them now. So, he convinces the, per uh, the other Athenians to attack now. You've still got all sorts of chaos on the beach, but as the Athenians are coming down, the Persians notice this, and their great king, uh, their general, not their great king, uh, forms up the units that he has control over and uh, gets ready to meet the Greeks. The Greeks go down the hill. Now we come to the, so that's the second strike against normal military logic. We'll get to the third strike tomorrow. That's where we'll leave. Second strike. Any questions, comments, or thoughts? Okay. Then you may certainly... Uh, um, ask if you have anything later. You can talk among yourselves until dismissal. Thank you to you at home. See you tomorrow.